I'm honored to be here this morning. I'm on a mission of the Holy Ghost. I, I feel like an arrow headed to the center of the target. No superfluous motion, no wasted effort. I feel in the Holy Ghost, I know exactly where I'm supposed to go. That I am to minister in this house to someone feeling overwhelmed. That life has crashed in on you and you just don't know where to turn. I, I, I got on that infamous, always reliable source, the web, Wikipedia, and I started looking up the, the natural disasters in Canada and I noticed shipwrecks and storms and the like and we have the same sort of list in the U.S. 125 years ago last month, one of, uh, one of the greatest natural disasters took place in the U.S. It's absent from today's history books, but until then it was the greatest tragedy the United States had ever experienced, the loss of 2,200 lives. Some people may remember the great San Franciscan earthquake. Some may remember the sinking of the Titanic. Please do not hum that theme song right now. Some will remember the attack on Pearl Harbor or a great storm that hit where I live that cost 10,000 people their lives. But almost erased from our collective consciousness is an event that was so simple but so tragic in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. It was on May 31, 1889, the South Fork Dam failed. And a few days prior, there had been a 12-inch rain in the area and the emergency spillway clogged with debris and the dam experienced a phenomenon known as overtopping, that the water started flowing over the top of the dam. And one of the dangers of an earthen dam is that when it's overtopped, the cascading water down the face of the dam can erode the foundation beneath. And on that day, the dam gave way and 20 million tons of water gushed out of the reservoir, bringing death to the valley inhabitants below. And I only say that to say this. I sense, if you will, that in the world that we're living in today, there is an overtopping taking place. That the emergency spillways and the coping mechanisms are no longer capable of keeping up with the difficulties we're facing right now. And you may have come in this house and capital community this morning feeling overtopped and overwhelmed. And the Holy Ghost has commanded me to minister to you today. Here's my marching orders. It's found in Isaiah 35. I am to strengthen weak hands in this building. My, my role here today is to make firm the feeble knees. And I am to say to anyone in this room that's fearful hearted, you be strong. And don't you be afraid, because your God's on his way. He is coming with vengeance, with the recompense, the reward of God. And I love this last line. He will come and save you. If you would allow me to minister just a moment, how to walk when you can't even stand. Would you just place your Bibles down right now? Let's pray one for another. Father, I thank you for this unique privilege. What a tremendous honor to stand in this pulpit today where so many wonderful messages have been delivered, God, given by your hand to your servants, O Lord. I thank you, O Father, in this house. I pray your blessings on every family represented here right now. Everyone in the sphere of influence, God, from each person in this room right now, Lord. Uh, and I pray for each individual, God, that you are going to strengthen someone in this house. Uh, you're going to give them the wherewithal and the inner resources and the inner bracing to stand uh, against the last day storm. Uh, and I give you praise and I give you glory in the wonderful name uh, of Jesus Christ. Put your hands together and let's praise him in the house right now. God, you are so good. You are so good. And I will bless the Lord at all times. 
Let your praise, let your praise be in my mouth. In Jesus' name, and God bless you. may be seated, and I apologize for this opening reference. I deeply apologize to Brother Woodward today. I deeply apologize, but I feel like the manager of a rogue Starbucks shop in Manhattan. When the superstorm Sandy swept up the Atlantic seaboard in 2012, you may remember it was a bizarre storm. It was formed of a hurricane and a northeaster, and it was just a devastating area and hit the major population centers of the U.S. and the havoc that it caused, everything started shutting down. At that time, there were 202 Starbucks shops in Manhattan Island. I'm ministering to somebody right now that you didn't get your caffeine this morning. And, and um, you know, the church I pastor, it has Keurig coffee pots on every pew. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. But as the storm approached, most managers began the shutdown procedures, put up the closed signs and the windows, and Starbucks had sent out notices from Virginia through Maine asking the stores to close at 2 p.m. But one shop, that one half of 1% in Manhattan, said, you know what, I just feel like when a rough time comes, people need to connect, and people need to sense that this too shall pass. And so the manager of the Starbucks restaurant adjacent to the Marriott Marquis in Times Square of New York City did the unthinkable. He pulled down the clothes sign and he opened up. And soon the caffeine junkies started making their way through the hurricane to the Starbucks shop. One customer said, the world is a scary place without Starbucks. Another one said, I ordinarily come to Starbucks four and five times a day, and I can't imagine my life without it. Or here's a picture of a young mother, Bethany Owings, who saw on Facebook that this rogue Starbucks had opened. She carried her 18-month-old daughter uh, 10 blocks walking through Hell's Kitchen to get to that Starbucks shop. She said, you know, there's nothing else in the world I would have gone out the storm for but a cup of coffee. It was called the last Starbucks standing. Well, you may scoff and you may deride and you may ridicule, but let me just tell you, if you've ever been through the storm of your life, you know when you're feeling overwhelmed and your world is shaking, and you begin to look, you look for anything you can hold on to. Any rope, any anchor, any hold, any relationship, any listening ear, any caring heart. It's not a very progressive forward theme, but sometimes you just want to put on the chart, church marquee, still standing. Or still trying to stand. Or better yet, I fell flat on my face, but we're trying to get back up again because we live in an overwhelmed world and the avalanches of the last days have begun we are being overtopped and overwhelmed by a flood of last day issues and thoughts that are eroding the foundations we are living in a day that what can be shaken is being shaken and it's not only happening on the world stage but in the world at home and we may as well come to the place where we don't don't look at it and enter into denial, but say it's happening, and it's happening all around us. Uh, but there's got to come a place and there's got to come a time when no matter what's going on around you, that it's not circumstance uh, that rules your heart, but it's the peace of God that rules your heart, uh, where you say, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through, uh, and I have a foundation and an anchor within the veil, uh, and I have a place that I'm going to. Can you say amen to that? We live in a world that life can lay us very, very low. Oftentimes I recall some of the statements made by Alvin Toffler in his book. Uh, it was written and published when I was in junior high school called Future Shock. He defined future shock as the shattering stress and the disorientation that we induce in individuals by subjecting them to too much change in too short a time. And that's the world we're living in right now. Too much change in too short of time. If I was to begin a list of what has happened, not just in my lifetime, but in the last five years, it, uh, each of us would begin to gain a sense of being 
overwhelmed. There are changes in our society for the worse. There is an increasing decadence and violence witnessed in our world, and we are witnessing the undeniable collapse of institutional foundations. We are being overwhelmed. We live in a wired 24-7 world uh, where instantaneous responses are demand. The sense of privacy has been erased by the digital revolution. People share every random thought in real time via social media. Traditional boundaries have dissolved in gender, family, marriage, church. And speaking of the church, the persecution of the righteous is on the increase and increasingly the stand for truth and righteousness and godly convictions. It's being redefined and cast as hate speech. There are four telltale signs of the last days that are around us. Hyper grace is number one, or what the Bible calls licentiousness. The second is a spirit of lawlessness. The Antichrist is called the lawless one. Number three is a denial of the truth of God's word that everything is relative in this postmodern age, and finally, a de-emphasis of the world to come, where people are living for the moment and not living for eternity. They are living for here and now and not there and then. These days are those days that were prophesied about too much change in too short a time, and the Holy Ghost prompted me in prayer this morning. He urged me to remember that when I stand up here and speak. Uh, there are a myriad of needs in, these ro- in this room. Uh, there are thousands of broken dreams uh, and hundreds of crushed spirits uh, and dozens of messed up lives uh, and marriages. Uh, and there are always those that are on the edge of the ad- abyss uh, looking into that pool, uh, ready to cash their chips in, going down for the last time. It's to you that I speak today. Uh, you that are about ready uh, to say, I don't know what I'm going to do I need help I was a young pastor when I don't know where I came across it I found a letter that was read to a preacher that was sent to a preacher I read it as a very young pastor and I have never forgotten this letter that when I get up and preach that I need to remind myself of this letter the letter reads dear preacher I'm a member of your audience, and I sit before you in silent desperation. I'm the mother of a good Christian teen girl who just told me that she's expecting a child. I'm a husband whose marriage is falling apart, and no matter what I do, I can't seem to stop it. I'm a child who has tried hard to win the affection of my dad, but all I hear from him is how many times I fail. I'm a senior citizen who sees that my life is coming to a close and I'm worried and scared not knowing if my life has made a difference or if my future is secure. I'm a father of three children and the doctor just told me that my wife can't possibly live for more than a couple of months. I'm a widow who sits alone in my home so lonely yet no one seems to care. I'm by all accounts a successful man who's gotten everything he's wanted in life but it hasn't been enough. I'm blue, I'm depressed, I don't even know why, but I can't go on living like this any longer. I'm a parent who raised my child in church, but now he's so far away from the Lord, we can't even talk about church anymore. I'm single, and I just invested everything I had in a relationship, and the person walked away without ever looking back. I'm a wife whose husband rarely speaks to me, and I can't remember the last time he held me or told me he loved me. I feel so lonely, abandoned, even in my home. You you can't see my desperation, preacher, by looking at me. I've learned to hide my feelings so deeply that sometimes even I fool myself. That the people who sit on either side of me in church would be surprised to know that I walk the floor each night and do nothing but cry. So preacher, when I sit in front of you on Sunday morning, I don't want to hear your thoughts on transactional analysis or theological exhortations. I don't want to hear the latest joke. I don't want you to share a few thoughts with me that you gleaned from the night before. But preacher, when I sit before you on Sunday morning, would you please remember that I'm hurting and I 
feel empty and useless with nowhere to go. And my question to you, preacher, is the same. The king asked God's prophet Jeremiah, is there any word from the Lord? I hear the same cry that Jeremiah heard thousands of times uh, each week and month. Uh, I hear the same cry that Ezekiel heard uh, when people asked him and said, I, I, I've read the newspapers. I, I see what's going on. Uh, and would you please tell me uh, what these things have to do uh, with us today? I need to tell you something this morning, Fredericton. Uh, though all else fails you, uh, there is one uh, who will never fail you. The psalmist said, hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I will cry unto you when my heart, not if my heart, but when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me uh, to the rock uh, that is higher than I. When you feel the waves and the billows have gone over you and no one seems to care, when you don't feel like you're capable of standing, uh, let his word uh, take you by the hand uh, and lead you to the rock uh, that is higher than anything else. I don't want to be long on description and short on prescription, but if you would allow me right now, I want to show you that there are ways that you can get up and walk again. Oh, you can't walk again. But first you have to know how you fell in the first place. Sometimes we fall because we're confronted by a stronger force and it puts us flat on our back. That seemed to be the case with Job. He had it all, a wonderful wife, beautiful children, many possessions. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camel, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, 11 Visa cards, and nine American Express cards. He was, according to Scripture, the greatest man in all of the East. But Scripture says, now there was a day. You never know. What a day holds. You may be cleaning your fingernails out there right now, but can I tell you, you don't know what a day is going to hold. You don't know what you're going to face tomorrow. You don't know what you're going to face Wednesday. You don't know what's coming to you. But if there's anything I've learned being raised in church uh, is whenever there's a blessing going around, you better get all you can get. And whenever the Spirit of the Lord is moving, uh, you better find all the strength that you can get because you never know what a day is going. That's why we praise Him. Uh, even when everything is going okay and we're rocking along, uh, is we never Never know what a day is going to hold. And here's that day. A series of servants began to bring messages to Job, each worse than the first. The first messenger came and said, The Sabaeans have raided us and killed the oxen and donkeys and your servants. And while he was still speaking, the Bible says, Here comes another messenger. Fire of God fell from heaven, lightning bolt from the sky. Put all your sheep on the rotisserie. We are having broiled mutton for lunch, Job, whether you want it or not. Before he finished speaking, yet another came and said, Camels gone, Chaldeans took them. Sheep gone, camels gone, oxen gone, donkeys gone. And Job may have said, well, at least I have my family. But had that thought entered into his mind, it was dissolved when the next servant said a tornado struck the house where your sons and daughter were. And Job, they're all dead. You're going to have to come to a place in that day where you can walk in faith when you can't even stand. When you are flat on your back, you've got to learn how to see the heavens open and have visions of God. You may be reduced to nothing, but so long as you hold on to your 
praise. Then you can walk when you can't stand. If you can cling to your hope, and Job said, oh, I wish my words were engraved with an iron pen and rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives. And though my body and my health are destroyed in my flesh, I shall see God. You see, when you're flat on your back, you can walk in faith. You can walk spiritually if you still got your praise and you still have your hope. Alan Gardner was a missionary to the island chain of Tierra del Fuego. He died on Picton Island in hostile circumstances. Immense physical difficulties met the missionary there. Years later, his body would be found with his diary laying nearby. The diary told the story of his thirst, his wounds, his loneliness, his hunger, his hostility. But the last entry in shaky handwriting in his diary reads this. I am overwhelmed with a sense of the goodness of God. You will be overwhelmed. You choose to be overwhelmed by life or you are overwhelmed by the goodness of the almighty God. I feel a spirit of Pilate coming over me when I want to say I find no fault uh, in him. I lay no charge at his feet uh, foolishly that my God, uh, whether I can understand what's happened to me or not, uh, he's been good to me uh, all the time uh, and all the time God uh, is good. I don't need to know why. Uh, I just need to know there is a why uh, and that you care about me. Would you praise him in this house right now? Magnify him in this place. So sometimes you're overwhelmed by a stronger force, and sometimes you fall simply because you're heartbroken. That's where we find Hannah. Hannah had been cruelly taunted by Peninnah, and she couldn't stand it any longer, and she fell flat on her face. But where you fall, makes all the difference in the world. Hannah fell between the porch and the altar, and there she cried out to God. Last night I took a journey to a land across the seas. I didn't go by boat or plane. I traveled on my knees. Because when you fall between the porch and the altar, you can make a journey that you can never make when you are walking and standing. Uh, Hannah traveled on her knees uh, that day. The moon is a quarter of a million miles from planet Earth. The sun, 92 million miles. Nearly 40 years ago, NASA's Voyager 1 took off for the edge of the solar system, traveling at 38,000 miles per hour. It has now traveled billions of miles, and we hear that it's finally reached the edge of our solar system. It took 40 years to get to the edge uh, of our solar system, but we will have to wait another 40,000 years uh, until that little man-made object gets to the nearest star. But on that day between the porch and the altar, Hannah made a journey instantaneously into the throne room of of heaven. Uh, she made a decision. Uh, I'm going to fall somewhere, but I choose to fall uh, in the presence of the almighty God uh, because he can take me places uh, that I can never go by myself. When you got nothing left but God, you got enough to start all over again. If you're, if you're holding to his hand, what does Solomon say? Who is this that cometh up out of the wilderness leaning on the arm of her beloved? If you get out of this situation you're in, it's not going to be through your intellect, your ingenuity, your character, your charisma, your gifts, your IQ, your ability. You're going to get out of it because you learned to fall in the right place and you're leaning on the arm. Oh, we used to sing a song, leaning, leaning, leaning underneath of the everlasting arms of God. Sometimes we fall when we are struck down, like the man on the Jericho Road, struck down by robbers and thieves, like Simon Peter who was brought down by his age-old nemesis, Simon Peter, or like the apostle Paul who was pierced with a thorn in the flesh, 
a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him. And three times Paul cried out to God like Hannah did. But God finally said, Paul, I may not heal you, but I will give you grace to walk on. And furthermore, through that weakness, I will use you and make you strong. It was a couple hundred years ago, a young couple, Simon and Monique, gave birth to a bundle of joy. A boy named Louis, a boy who was all boy. They lived in a small house near Paris, and Simon was a harness maker, and leather tools were very dangerous. And so the boy was always warned, don't ever enter into father's shop alone. But the boy was irrepressible. And at the age of four, he slipped into his father's shop and began to play with the leather tools. And one of the tools was an awl, a sharp instrument used to punch holes in leather. Lewis was holding the awl. When he stumbled, he fell, and he punctured one of his eyes with that tool. At first, it looked okay that he would save the sight in that one eye. But the injured eye became infected, and the boy kept rubbing his eye, and soon the infection went from the damaged eye to the healthy eye. And at the age of four, Lewis became completely blind. He was fortunate in this sense that he studied at the Royal Institute for Blind Youth in Paris. He excelled as a musician, and I've learned this, that when you struggle in one area, God allows you to grow in another area. But at the age of 12, Lewis began to ask the question, how can the blind read? And his mind went back to a tool in his father's leather shop, the awl. And when Lewis returned home for the summer, he found the awl and he used it to form a series of raised dots for what the French military called night riding. And with the very instrument that had blinded him, Lewis Braille worked until he created a system of dots wherewith the blind could read and write. What is your all? What makes you crawl? What humbles you? I've lived long enough to know that what brings you down is not your enemy. It's your friend in disguise. And if you're struggling right now, that is not just the enemy you're facing, but my Bible says, I'm sorry, my Bible says this, all things work together for the good that anything that's humbling you and caused you to fall, that there's something good in the midst of that. And if you're struggling right now, that there is something that can get a hold of you and help you get back on your feet again, that God is going to use that instrument that hurts you to turn around and bless other people. Paul said in 2 Corinthians uh, that the blessing we received when we were afflicted, uh, that we give to other people, that what you you're going through may not be about you at all but God is trying to bless somebody nearby you and he's trying to teach you the lesson where you're going to get a hold of something and you're going to be a blessing to somebody else Blanchard once said for daily need daily grace sudden need sudden grace but for overwhelming needs there is over Overwhelming grace. And so my message this Sunday morning is what Jesus said in Luke 5, and you remember the story, when a paralyzed man couldn't even stand, and four of his friends walked him to Jesus Christ, and they carried him to the roof. They lowered him in the presence of Jesus, and Jesus said, which is easier, to say your sins be forgiven you, or rise and walk? That's my message to you right now. Get up and walk again. I'm not talking about willpower and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. I'm not talking about Norman Vincent Peale and the power of positive thinking. Uh, I'm certainly not talking about wishful thinking. Uh, but Dr. Martin Luther King once said, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving uh, forward. Uh, you say, preacher, how do I move forward? It's a hands and a feet proposition. Position. The scripture says strengthen the weak hands, hands that have lost their grip, 
Hands that are no longer capable of holding on with the strength they once had. Strengthen the weak hands. How do we do that, Pastor? We do it this way. By believing that even though my grip is weak, his grip is strong. George Beverly Shea used to sing at the Billy Graham Crusades, and uh, in occasion he would ask for he would ask for song requests. And one day he he wrote in his biography. He said, "I I received a song request that was rather unusual. Uh, the title of the song is poor grammar, but great theology. God's grip don't slip." Your grip may slip. Your hands may grow weak. uh, But oh, he is powerful uh, to save. His arm uh, is not short. uh, Oh, when you don't feel like you can go on uh, any longer, he can reach and save uh, to the uttermost. That's what my God uh, can do. Oh, oh, praise God. Brother Gurley, how can I rely on the grip of God? You need to believe that God is at work in your life. He's either healing you or giving you the strength to face what you're going through. When you can't hold on to him, he's got a hold of you. You need to believe that and don't ever let go of that. Make firm the feeble knees. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And when you're not strong in yourself, find your strength in him. I mentioned, I think it was yesterday or the day before about King Saul when he was at Gilboa. And you remember he and his three sons perished at Gilboa because of the father's disobedience. And the Bible says when, when David heard the news that King Saul, his nemesis and predecessor, had perished, he did not rejoice, he did not dance, but he grieved. He grieved. Because he said there on Gilboa's hills, The shield of the mighty was cast away. The shield as though it had not been anointed with oil. You see back then, the shields were not metal and bronze, but they were hoops of wood over the which leather was stretched. And to be supple and effective in battle, the shield had to be anointed with oil. That's why the major prophet said, Arise, princes, and anoint your shield that there is something magnetic and powerful. I, I've studied Ephesians 6 and so have you and we've gone through the believer's armor starting with the, the helmet of the hope of salvation and we talk about the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And in one hand, you have the sword of the spirit. In the other hand, you have that mighty shield of faith. But that's where we often stop. And we don't go on any farther. But if you keep reading on, it says praying always in the spirit. In the spirit. And one of the abiding emblems of the Holy Ghost in the Old Testament is that of oil. That if you are going to stand in the evil day, you better make sure your shield of faith has been on. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in this right now. You better make sure. Well, Brother Gurley, I talked in tongues when I was 16. You need to be renewed in the spirit. There needs to be, when you're facing the evil day, you need to make sure. It seems that Saul had gone into battle. He had con- he had consulted the witch of Endor. He had consulted the carnal, but he forgot to anoint his shield uh, with oil. I I don't know about you, uh, but I want to make certain uh, in the day when everybody is being overwhelmed, uh, how I have a word for you. Be filled uh, with the Spirit. Uh, Let there be an anointing from heaven uh, that comes and graces you. I was reading a book about warfare a while back. And in reading the book about warfare, they, they talked about one of the oldest offensive weapons known to man. And uh, I was thinking sword, spear, club, boot, I don't know. What's the oldest offensive? And they said it's the, it's the polished shield. And they said because ancient warriors knew 
that if they could position themselves correctly to the sun and hold up their shields, that the enemy could be blinded by the, and in fact, when you read of the story of Jehoshaphat, and when it says they arrayed themselves for battle, that's one of the instances quoted in this military book. They said what they did was they faced the rising sun and held up their anointed shields uh, that your faith will fight for you. That your faith uh, and the light of another world is so dazzling, uh, is so effulgent in its glory uh, that it will blind uh, the enemy. Uh, let me tell you what will blind the enemy uh, when you lose your sheep uh, and you lose your donkeys uh, and you lose your camels uh, and you lose your children and you lose the affection of your wife and you lose your health uh, but you say the Lord gives uh, and the Lord takes away blessed be the name of the Lord oh somebody praise him in this house right now somebody praise him Oh, come on, let's blind the enemy in this building right now. I don't know what you've been through this week. I don't know what you're facing next week. But let's blind the enemy a little while and say, I still love him. I still praise him. I still magnify him. Can we stand all over the building? Musicians, come. I'm almost through. Oh. I didn't preach long because the Holy Ghost has a work to do in this building this morning. And the Spirit needs me to shut up where the Holy Ghost can start walking up and down every aisle in this building right now and beginning to lift burdens off of people's shoulders and help them walk again when they can't even stand. It was those a few years older than I when the polio epidemic swept through. I still remember stories of kids being placed in iron lungs to breathe. And I remember stories of what happened before the vaccination was common in the U.S. I came across one of those old stories Arthur Gordon tells a story about a three-year-old boy struck with polio who was abandoned in a New York City hospital. A compassionate foster family took that child in, cared for him for several years until, until they had heard that a warmer climate would do good for those struck with polio. And so they had some family members down south. They sent the family this boy to live with family in the state of Georgia. What helped him, though, was more than the warmer climate. There was an elderly woman who cared for him. Her name was Mama Jean. For six years, she daily massaged that boy's weak legs and atrophied muscles. She would take him to a nearby stream and place him on a rock where he could lean back on his hands and let the waters flow around his weak legs. She prayed for him daily. And every day she encouraged him with stories of how God had answered her prayers. Night after night, Mama Jean kept believing and kept praying until, until the day came. You never know what a day holds for ill or for good. But one morning she woke up the boy and said, son, I have a surprise for you. A 12-year-old boy later said, she led me out into the yard, placed me with my back against an old gnarled oak tree. I can still feel the rough bark today. She took away my crutches and she pulled off my leg braces. She moved back a dozen paces and said, son, here's the surprise. 
Last night, the Lord spoke to me in a dream. And he told me, this is the day for your prayers to be answered. So now, son, walk to me. He said, my instant reaction that day was fear. I knew I could not walk unaided and I, I had tried. I shrank back against the solid support of the tree, but Mama Jean looked at me with tears flowing down her face in an earnest look. And she said, son, walk to me. I burst in tears. I begged. I pleaded. Uh, her voice suddenly was no longer coaxing and gentle, uh, but full of power and authority when she said, boy, you can walk. The Lord has spoken to me. Now walk over here. She knelt down and extended her arms. And that boy said, somehow I felt impelled by a force stronger than anything I had ever felt. Certainly stronger than my fear. I took a faltering step and then another and another until I reached Mama Jean and fell into her arms, both of us weeping. It was two more years before I could walk normally, but from that day forward, I never used crutches to believe. I'm on a mission of the Holy Ghost to tell you, if you don't have the faith to believe, I do, and others do in this building uh, because we've been where you're at uh, and we've watched God defy impossible odds uh, and put us back on our feet again. And we learn to walk not on our power, but on the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm not speaking so much of physical infirmities. I'm speaking of the unseen world of the inner man right now. That you may feel overtopped and overwhelmed. Your world may have crashed in on you. But can I tell you right now, on this day, on Sunday morning, June 29, in the year of our Lord, 2014, this is your to get up from the ashes of defeat and say, I'm not staying here any longer. And I'm not going to live a life of fear and dread and discouragement and doubt and hurt and misery. But I'm stepping into my promise, the promise of the Lord. And I am going to walk in the power of the Holy Ghost into the calendar that he has set before me. Oh. oh, he's here right now, folks. He's here in this building. And he's, he's nudging me right now saying, get out of the way, get out of the way, get out of the way. Before I step back and let the Lord have his way in this building, let me tell you this. He can't move until you We used to sing a song when I was growing up. If you take one step, you'll take two. It starts with you. You've got to say, Lord, I want a blessing more than anything I've wanted in my entire life. And you have to bid adieu to your pew and say, I'm out of here. And I'm going to find myself a place around the front and every step I take. I'm pulling a Romans 16, 20 with every step that I take that the God of my peace shall bruise Satan under my feet. Uh, under my feet. Uh, I've got to move to get him underneath uh, my feet. Uh, I may be shaky. I may not do it just right. Uh, but I am moving uh, into the realm of the blessing uh, and I'm going to receive what I need in the Holy Ghost uh, today that God uh, is going to do it right now. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. 
I don't know hardly anybody here. I don't have my glasses on, so you are just all fuzzy blobs out there right now. But here's what I just heard the Holy Ghost tell me. We're going to start this from the back today. I want the back row just emptied out right now. Would you start moving all over in the back row? And then the next to the last row, just start moving. Start moving right now. Start moving right now. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. As quick as you can, as swiftly as you can, start moving. Those in the balcony, come on down. I feel the Holy Ghost. We're starting from the back today because I just feel that somebody snuck in here today with a great need in your heart and mind uh, and you said, I'm just going to go and see the next row come on and the next row come on uh, and the next row come on uh, and the next row come on. Uh, oh, just press in. Press in as close as you can. Get it right to the edge right now. Oh, the Holy Ghost. Altar workers, ministers, come help me. Uh, come help me uh, because somebody is going to be set free. Somebody is going to be delivered in this building. Next row, come on. The next row, come on. Hasten, hasten. Uh, the front rows are waiting on you. Uh, come ahead, come ahead. Uh, come ahead, come ahead. Uh, just keep pressing in. Just clear the aisles out. Keep pressing in. Uh, Spirit of the Lord uh, is wanting to move in this place right now. Oh, hallelujah. This is beautiful. Isn't this beautiful? Turn around and grab a hand of somebody next to you right now. I'm not going to stop till the Holy Ghost tells me to stop. Why don't you bring them and say, would you come pray with me? Uh, oh, there is an anointing in this building today. There is help in this building today. Oh, I feel the presence of the Lord. Can you feel him in this building right now? Can you feel him in this house right now? Uh, you're going to walk again. I know. You're going to get up and start.